Mr. Murphy entered into this agreement on the the understanding that Ms. Taft was terminally ill, uh, based on her representations to Mr. Murphy would be dying within the year. Now he is being told by her numerous uh, friends and family that she is not in fact terminally ill, nor was she ever terminally ill. And mom went over to Mr. Johnson's home and physically assaulted him. There is now a PPO. Uh, her boyfriend was also there and assaulted. First, we're not asking for a restriction against uh, members of the opposite sex, but rather a restriction against persons with whom either party has a sexual relationship. Uh, we, we, we don't want to expose the child to any uh, new partners at this point. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the person would be a, a, an opposite gender. The parties recently lost their daughter um, in a, a foster care removal. It was a, a provision that there would be no overnight guests. She's been charged with uh, two counts of fourth degree child abuse. She is not allowed any okay. no overnight parenting time, nothing. There is no risk of harm to the child with a denial of grandparenting time. There is a risk of harm to the child if grandparenting time is exercised because this child does not want to see the grandparents and to call her out of the house kicking and screaming would be traumatic to her. He's also been violent toward Miss Grapp in the presence of the children, including threatening to break down the door of the children's bedrooms while the children were inside it. We're asking the court to require Mr. Fields to pay uh, attorney fees and costs for this matter because the defendant is not able to bear the expenses of continuing to defend this custody matter. She was forced to leave the household and did not stick around to collect any money, ask for any remuner remuneration for her part of the household. Mr. Fields has a home with 30 acres. She's paying just under $1,200 for child support. That's not going to change your support if you voluntarily assume responsibility oh, for somebody oh, else's children. That is my client's vehicle in Florida when it was wrecked in Florida, which is why he got the, um, and I and then there was a, a person that died in that accident. Wi-Fi phone calls do not show up on a phone record. I just objected to her as stating that somebody told her that as hearsay, uh -oh. um, but she said that anyway, the court allowed it. So I'm just saying my client simply wants nothing to do with Ms. McKediak. Kimberly Taft versus Scott Murphy. Court will note the appearance of Mr. Schaefer on behalf of plaintiff and Ms. Capture on behalf of the defendant. This matter is before the court on the defendant's motion for relief from judgment, Ms. Capture. As we stated in our motion, Mr. Murphy entered into this agreement on the, the understanding that Ms. Taft was terminally ill and based on her representations to Mr. Murphy would be dying within the year. Um, the agreements that he agreed to essentially are uh, unconscionable, uh, especially given the fact that there is a massive divide between Mr. Murphy and the children now. He doesn't have the parenting time that he would have wanted, but obviously gave more parenting time to Ms. Taft given her assertion that she was dying. Um, he wanted to keep things as um, even for her, even isn't the the correct word, but essentially he wanted to make sure that she would have a, a decent rest of her life. Um, so they didn't divide the business. Um, a lot of the things that they kept around, like the country club dues, the tickets for uh, the baseball and football or basketball and football games. Um, essentially, he agreed to this on the understanding that she was going to be passing. Um, if she's not, and he has tried to communicate with her and say, hey, what, what's actually going on because I'm being told that you aren't terminally ill um, and that you induced me into agreeing to this agreement without uh, under uh, a, a false allegation. So uh, essentially, Your Honor, what we're asking for is uh, an evidentiary hearing so we can put proofs on the record to say, Mr. Murphy did enter into this agreement under uh, a duress that he believed false information presented by Ms. Taft. Um, even within his pro con, he stated, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to quote this directly, but he stated um, an understanding that he was entering into this agreement due to her terminal illness um, without counsel, without representation, and simply signed the dotted line due to the misrepresentations that she 
placed to him. Um, so, Your Honor, we're looking for an evidentiary hearing to prove that misconduct did occur uh, and then to move forward with this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer? Your Honor, we have filed an extensive answer. Uh, number one, uh, we submit that this is an improper motion for a number of reasons. Number one, the allegations alleged that my client said are not true. Uh, next one is that it's pretty that it's under dress, arrest pressured based on the allegations therein. Number three, I, this was filed because my client hasn't died yet. Well, they didn't give her a year. Uh, it's February 29th. Uh, I represent to this court melanoma. It's in remission at the present time and to see uh, that there's something in about this. What is improper on this is that counsel for the other side signed these pleadings knowing that the business was owned by both of the parties. We have submitted evidence of that and this was filed just before there is a uh, oppression suit that is going to be filed in relation to the, the, the division of the uh, of the business. Uh, client uh, is asking for costs and sanctions in that regard because uh, both the client and the attorney sign pleadings knowing that there's a 50-50 ownership in the business. My client has never uh, used her melanoma in any way to affect judgment. It was a choice of a defendant not to be represented. He had been represented around this matter and chose not to. That was his decision. Now he is uh, crying sour grapes. His uh, allegation about the children, his relationship with the children at the time was poor at best and did not exercise his parent time at this time. We submit that this motion is unfounded in fact and law should be dismissed and that costs should be assessed in relation to the improper pleadings. Thank you. Anything else, uh, Ms. Katcher? Uh, Your Honor, I, the pleadings aren't improper. Uh, again, this is not so much about um, the allegations that this is a jointly owned business. We admit in our uh, in our motion that there's a marital interest in this. Um, again, Your Honor, this is simply about the misrepresentation by Ms. Taft that she is terminally ill. Uh, she induced my client into signing a divorce decree to get this settled so that she could live in peace the last time, however long it was going to be. Mr. Murphy has requested on numerous occasions, can you just communicate with me about what's going on? And she refuses to. Um, and now he is being being told by her numerous um, uh, friends and family that she is not, in fact, terminally ill, nor was she ever terminally ill, and that he agreed to this under the misre misrepresentation that she was. Uh, again, Your Honor, we, we state in our motion specifically that we are just simply asking to have all of this resolved. However, Ms. Taft will not communicate. Um, and if she is going to continue living, which is great, good for her, we want her to be in remission, we want her to be healthy. Um, but if she's going to continue, obviously the marital property needs to be divided appropriately, um, including the business. Uh, that's not to say that we uh, are saying, well, we shouldn't ever divide the property. We simply need an answer and we need the correct answer, not a lie. If she's going to be passing on, well, then let's let's get that resolved and we would, would withdraw our motion. But we obviously she's in remission, um, allegedly. So it, then she obviously didn't have terminally ill um, uh, melanoma like she represented to my client. Well, in this matter, the court does note that fraud has been alleged, but uh, as I go through the pleadings here, the argument, there's been very little factual basis for the uh, allegations. I don't believe that uh, in this matter, the uh, defendant has set forth a prima facie case for the court to... Uh, again, intervene at this time. Uh, and so the court believes that if in some time in the uh, 
if the defendant can develop those particular facts, then, they, then the defendant can file an amended motion in this matter. But at this point, the court doesn't believe that there's a factual basis uh, in this matter other than a he said, she said. And as a result, the court will deny the motion at this time. And the court doesn't believe there's a basis for award of costs or fees. So I will deny that request by both parties and ask Mr. Schaefer, you prepare the order denying the motion. I will, Your Honor. Thank you. You're free to go. Have a good day. Kelly Johnson versus Jeremy Johnson. Court will note the appearance of Ms. Henderson on behalf of plaintiff, Ms. Capture on behalf of defendant. The matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion to modify judgment of divorce concerning parenting time and support. Uh, I don't need a rehash of this. So as you probably know, we have 11 motions at nine o'clock. So we're really stacked up. So if you would just, uh, again, respond to whatever the other uh, party's answer or motion is stated. And I do note that in this matter that the uh, the motion, and that states that uh, Ms. Hunter, basically, who was tasked with developing and overseeing parenting time, can't or won't do it at this time. So matters come before the court at that point. Anything else, uh, Ms. Henderson? No, Your Honor. Essentially, um, the parties have joint legal, joint physical custody without specific parenting time. Upon uh, conversations with Ms. Hunter, she stated her license does not allow her to do what the judgment tasks her to do. So based on the factual impossibility and also pursuant to MCL 72227A, we're simply asking for specific parenting time to be developed. Um, uh, Ms. Hunter stated there's no reason why my client cannot exercise 50-50 parenting time. Um, I think a brief evidentiary hearing with Ms. Hunter's testimony uh, would be very helpful for the court to put something in, in order um, for specific parenting time for my client to be exercising, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Capture? Uh, Your Honor, I am aware of Ms. Hunter's position. Uh, I, I believe the most appropriate thing here is that we select a different parenting time coordinator uh, like Meredessa Katz. Um, it, the minor children have stated animately that they do not want to have a relationship with mom. Uh, this needs to be dealt with between the counselor. Um, right after the most recent incident where um, the minor children confronted mom, mom went over to Mr. Johnson's home and physically assaulted him. There is now a PPO. Uh, her boyfriend was also there and assaulted uh, Mr. Johnson. And so the timing of this motion uh, in particular is uh, a little disturbing when what we truly need here is a counselor to facilitate discussions between the minor children who are both um, 14 and 17, uh, who refused to have a relationship with mom, uh, given her erratic behaviors. Okay. Your Honor, if I may have a brief response. No, I don't need that. Ms. Capture, how about, uh, as recommended, that we maybe go to Ms. Uh, Ms. Katz. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, Your Honor, I don't think there is any dispute that Ms. Hunter is helpful to the family. Um, I don't know if Ms. Katz's license would allow her to provide a schedule to the family either, but essentially we want something that could be enforceable and something that could be followed by the parties. Mr. Johnson has refused any sort of parenting time to Ms. Johnson. Um, this is why we would like Ms. Hunter to provide testimony regarding that. Um, and as to allegations about domestic violence and or PPO, those are under uh, court proceedings. Currently, my client is objecting to both of those matters. So, Your Honor, I would ask for the court to schedule an evidentiary hearing for Ms. Hunter to provide her testimony. Uh, the parties are continuing counseling with her, and that is one of her recommendations. But there's no parenting time that she can develop uh, for both parties to follow. Yeah. What the court's going to do then uh, in this matter, we don't have an agreement in, as to how we're going to proceed. The court will refer the matter to the uh, referee for an evidentiary hearing on the issues of uh, parenting time and support, and uh, you'll get notice as to when that hearing is. You're free Thank to you go. Have much, a good Aaron. day. Trista Geyer versus Aaron Geyer. The court will note the appearance of Ms. McNiff on behalf of plaintiff, Ms. Capture on behalf of defendant. This matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion for temporary custody, parenting time support and to restrict, uh, again, the uh, somewhat of the opposite sex on an overnight basis with the uh, when the children are present. Again, I don't need a rehash of the motion. Ms. McNeff, have you received Ms. Capture's response? I, I have, Your Honor. Okay, um, if you want to respond to that. 
Well, briefly, first, we're not asking for a restriction against uh, members of the opposite sex, but rather a restriction against persons with whom either party has a sexual relationship. Uh, we, we, we don't want to expose the child to any uh, new partners at this point. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the person would be of uh, an opposite gender. Uh, the parties have been having a nesting situation, essentially, wherein uh, during the week, each party has the child for approximately half of the day, which means that they are uh, exchanging parenting time almost on a daily basis during the week. And then on the weekends, they're alternating. This is not a tenable situation moving forward. Uh, my client would like to move to uh, Livonia to stay with her parents uh, temporarily while she's able to seek uh, a better job and obtain, seek and obtain uh, housing for herself and for the minor child and to do continue with this nesting arrangement simply won't work if if uh, my, my client moves back and with her, with her parents. We're, we're asking for sole physical custody, but I understand that this court often maintains a status quo. However, the status quo with this nesting arrangement um, is, isn't, isn't going to work. And so we would ask first that, that my client be granted sole physical custody of, of the minor child or in the alternative that the court grant the parties uh, joint physical custody pending an evidentiary hearing on the issue of custody on an alternating week basis so that they can actually separate themselves. It's my understanding defendant would like to keep the marital home we're not disagreeing with that. However, um, uh, again, this this back and forth is 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 a lot of uh, a, a lot of exchanges between the parties. So uh, we believe that given the the past CPS complaints, and there have been two, uh, both were not substantiated. There was one each against each of the parties, one against defendant for emotional and verbal abuse one against plaintiff for failure to protect. Uh, but again, those haven't been substantiated. But but because of that, we have concerns about defendant's uh, ability to properly care for the child's emotional needs. And, and, and that's the basis for our request for sole physical custody. Okay, Ms. Capture. Uh, Your Honor, as we stated in, within our answer, there are, there are no concerns. Uh, CPS has no concerns. Um, my client is actually a DHS worker. Um, there are no concerns with regard to her and maintaining uh, a healthy relationship with the minor child. Obviously, the last eight months they have been um, participating within this nesting arrangement. Um, the parties uh, recently lost their daughter. Um, and a, a foster care uh, removal uh, due to the allegations that Miss uh, that uh, plaintiff alleged against my client. Um, However, despite that, um, they do have a healthy relationship. Um, they've come together on multiple occasions and supported each other on parenting. Um, again, eight months of uh, status quo is, is very impressive. Now, I will agree with Ms. McNiff and state that uh, a everyday uh, handoff is not necessarily the most efficient. However, the 223 uh, would be very tenable for these two parties. Um, the minor child does have autism and a few other, or not autism, I apologize. Um, he's He's got a, a few um, needs that he gets services through the county. Um, uh, specifically, <laughs> Well, essentially, all of his doctors are. Is Lisa gone? I apologize. We just lost power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been crazy right now. <laughs> okay, go ahead and continue, Ms. Um, again, I apologize. Not autism. Um, speech therapy. So he he's engaged in speech therapy and physical therapy here in the county. Um, he's lived here his entire life. He is an adopted child. Um, he does have siblings in this area still. Um, so the two parties have a strong connection to Calhoun County. Uh, we would strongly uh, oppose um, plaintiff moving out of county all the way to Livonia um, with the minor child. Uh, it would be very far against the status quo. And essentially, Your Honor, what we're asking for is the status quo, just a 50-50 arrangement between the parties. Um, the parties have made agreements about 
At Disney World, uh, in the coming months, I believe my client has purchased tickets, um, and that's been uh, all approved by plaintiff. Um, and so in, in total, these parties do tend to uh, co-parent very, very well. Um, obviously, it, it's a breakdown to the point where the nesting arrangement no longer works, and um, defendant would like to move back into the marital home and give plaintiff the opportunity to find other alternative housing. Okay. Ms. McNiff, I, I do note in the, uh, a lot of time was spent in the uh, answer talking about the, uh, again, the uh, move back of the uh, defendant into the home. Are, are you opposing that? We, we are not opposing that, Your Honor. And and just briefly, uh, my my client has the ability to move. Uh, even, even if the parties have joint custody, she can move within 100 miles. She would be moving within, uh, within 100 miles. The child is four. The child is not yet in school. And so I, th I think that this is an issue uh, where the child will go to school, where the child will ultimately live is an issue for an evidentiary hearing. I, I think without, without having all the evidence, the court can't make that decision. What we know right now is the parties have been splitting custody, but again, splitting custody on a daily basis is is not is not a long-term plan okay well what the court's going to do is the parties have been able to work together and the status quo is to them that they've had joint uh physical and legal custody so the court's going to continue that joint uh custody on this matter when parties having the children child on a 50 50 basis the court will uh I do note that obviously if somebody moves, whoever moves, that that person is not, uh, we're gonna have some issues as it relates to transportation, all that. The court will at this point allow the uh, parenting time to occur on alternating weeks, uh, starting at uh, six o'clock PM on Friday through the following Friday at six o'clock PM. Uh, the court will basically set support consistent with this particular arrangement. The court will acknowledge, as the parties have stated, that the defendant will move back into the home. Uh, so the court will grant to the defendant the possession of the home. I'll leave it up to the parties to try to work out a time frame for that to occur. And if you can't get that, then come back to the court in uh, this particular matter. That will be the uh, temporary order of this court. I ask Ms. McNiff that you would prepare that order and submit it under seven days. I will. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you all. You're free to go. Have a good day. Eric Stewart versus Angela Stewart. Court will note the appearance of Mr. Toth on behalf of the plaintiff, Mr. Sullivan on behalf of the defendant. This matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion to modify judgment of divorce. In this matter, uh, Mr. Toth. Your Honor, primarily we're here this morning um, regarding five-year-old Will, although I think that the uh, intent of our motion was to try to address issues related to the younger of the two minor child or children, Hawkins. Um, the parties share joint legal custody. They have a disagreement. I think everybody agrees with that. Um, in essence, Your Honor, my client following what he believes were recommendations both from Bright Lights as well as recommendations from the uh, CISD was that particularly um, Will, the five-year-old, but really both children, should be attending a preschool program. A preschool program is not daycare. Um, this isn't Mr. Stewart's first experience as a parent. He has, um, from a previous marriage, has two adult children and de dealt with educational issues through their entire lives. They did well. They're doing well as adults. Um, and, and he believes that, that in situations such as this, you should rely upon or take into consideration the recommendations of the professionals. In essence, it appears that we have dad, um, Mr. Stewart, who would like to see the more formal preschool program to help particularly Will uh, transition to kindergarten successfully, whereas uh, Ms. Stewart, um, prefer, uh, the, the, the defendant mother, prefers that her mother remain engaged. And I, although it's hearsay and of no real evidentiary value today, I found the letter authored by the maternal grandmother in this case is very, very interesting. And, and, and her, these are her words. 
At this point, Will meets or exceeds the requirements for kindergarten readiness with the exception of the area of social emotional skills. Both parties are in agreement with that, Your Honor. I think it's how it wants to be addressed, whereas the maternal grandmother prefers to address it in a less formal setting with peers, continuing what she's been doing, which, again, there's there's no disagreement that she's an ex-teacher and um, understands the educational component of it. Everyone agrees that the, the socialization is not being met. And in, the, in, in kindergarten, it's such things as stay in your seat and stay in line, and this is what task you're doing now. That can be accomplished in a quasi-classroom setting with peers, many of the same children who are going to transition into the kindergarten class, which I think even, even the, the defendant's mother would acknowledge that that would be, be helpful. So, um, we, we, uh, again, this is it would appear to be straightforward. And I think the, the real problem here, Your Honor, is the mischaracterization of the involvement of CISD as well as Bright Lights. Bright Lights offers a preschool program that is distinct from child care. Bright Lights is more than a child care provider. Uh, as far as the CISD, they may de- and we, we all agree they determine that Will is ineligible for any services, but that doesn't prohibit them from expressing uh, to Mr. Stewart and presumably to, to, to the defendant mother that in this particular case, Will would benefit more by the classroom setting. I think those are the issues. And, and quite frankly, Your Honor, if Will's going to go into a preschool program, there's no reason mm-hmm. that, that, that Hawkins shouldn't also. So that's the request, Your Honor. I think it's simple. I think it's straightforward. If there's going to be a factual dispute, I think it ought to be resolved by the input of the professionals as well as the parents. We're, we're not contending at all that the CISD or Bright Light should be making decisions that in place of the parents. It's rather taking the information that they have to offer and making then recommendations and then the parents making a decision as to what's best for the children. And unfortunately, in this situation, they're unable to do so. At the time the judgment was entered, the younger child was two years old and the older child was three years old. And there was absolutely no way to predict the circumstances that would exist as they exist now. Clearly, it's a changed circumstance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sullivan? Thank you, Honor. First, I would indicate that I would have opposed the idea that it is a changed circumstance sufficient to justify a hearing. First of all, the judgment of divorce was entered only approximately a year ago. The corrected judgment was entered in May of 23. And then getting into the nitty gritty of the motion, it appears that a lot of the, the, uh, the nitty gritty has been kind of backed away from in this oral argument. First, the uh, plaintiff misquoted the provision of the judgment by indicating that they're to spend at least two days of work at Bright Lights Daycare That's not true. And I quoted the exact language in paragraph three of the answer. Second, it is not true that CISD made any recommendation whatsoever about having either of the boys attend Bright Light preschool full time in the summer. It's just not in there. As a matter of fact, the CISD work only focused on an evaluation of the older child for the purpose of determining the needs or whether there would be additional needs to be provided when he enters kindergarten. And along with that, the other area of inaccuracy in the motion is that they write in their motion that uh, Will is at a a stage of having the option uh, this fall of either attending preschool or kindergarten. That's not true either. So their motion starts out with four or five factual inaccuracies that carries through and creates the theme of inaccuracy in the request that they make. Getting to the social and academic, I ask that you take a a careful look at the letter by Denise Myers, as well as uh, Exhibit B, which is uh, from Craig Bates. The social needs of both boys have been met entirely by the efforts of Denise Meyer's grandmother and my client. And if you look in the various uh, uh, writings, particularly in section in uh, paragraph six of our answer, and you look at all the activities that have gone on that these children have been 
uh, participating in at, by the efforts of the mother and the grandmother. And I might add, when it comes to these activities, uh, particularly the athletic activities, all of these, the cost of that, these activities have been paid by mother alone. They've been paid by mother alone. <clears throat> While I'm on the subject of, of the financials, Your Honor, the request that's being made uh, by the plaintiff would lead to a financial increase that my client would have to incur of from $126 a week to $378 a week. And including the fact that she pays all the extras for athletic, the equipment, the cost, et cetera. And it is important to note that if you look at the, the uh, child support payments made by the plaintiff, they have been consistently and habitually late nearly a month every month, which also puts my client at a financial uh, stress point. So to add this additional cost, when there is no benefit to the child, in fact, a detriment, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. So when you look at the social that's being provided to the boys, it comes from mother, it comes from gram grandmother, maternal grandmother, Miss Myers, and it doesn't come at all from the uh, plaintiff father. Also, as Miss Myers points out, we point out in our answer, there's a concept called social emotional learning uh, that, of course, Miss Myers, you can see from her letter and, and uh, that she's as expert as it gets in the area of providing uh, toddlers and young children uh, meeting their educational needs. And she talks about the need for social emotional learning and the need to have one-on-one -on -one with Will, particularly right now for that uh, need throughout the rest of the summer and to prevent him from what's referred to as the summer slide leading into kindergarten. And then when it, with regard to Hawkins, Hawkins does not need uh, social, I mean, he, he's very good socially. I think the parties would agree with that. What Hawkins needs and what Ms. Myers looks forward to is working with him one-on-one -on -one with his academic needs as he nears kindergarten. The answer also lays out a, a number of negatives that have occurred at Bright Lights, which in collectively would lead clearly to the conclusion that more time at Bright Lights is not better for the children. Actually, less time or no time is better. And then with regard to the distinction that uh, was drawn by Mr. Toth with, with respect to the child care half of Bright Lights and the preschool half, Your Honor, they are, it's one building. The, the children go back and forth between the two halves freely. So to suggest that there's that kind of uh, clear distinction between what goes on in that school is, is, is just not accurate. Finally, the, you know, the, the, uh, the motion seeks to take away parenting time from my client. My client is able to spend time during the week working from home with their children. And um, this uh, current arrangement has been in place now for only a year. It's working as best it can given the nature of bright lights. And we're asking that no change be made other than perhaps having the children attend a different daycare. But that would be the subject of, a, of another motion. Okay, thank you. Well, in this matter, the court has read the uh, pleadings and heard the argument today. Again, the court will note that, uh, again, the this recommendation from the CISD and all of that, those are just simply recommendations. They're not, uh, again, it's not any evidence or anything of that nature. The court does note that, uh, again, that the parties had in the judgment of divorce agreed to uh, the two days a week at the uh, Bright Lakes daycare uh, in this uh, case. The court notes that the uh, defendant has in their answer delineated the socialization that's occurring that's under paragraph six. And then throughout the answer, there's also other statements as to what is happening in the way of socialization in this matter. The court does not believe that there is a basis at this time to modify or change the judgment of divorce. And as a result, the court will deny the motion at this time. Mr. Sullivan, you can prepare an order denying that motion, submit it under seven day. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. You're free to go. Have a good day. Matthew Weller versus Katina Morley. Court will note the appearance of Mr. Podell on behalf of the plaintiff, Mr. Todd on behalf of defendants. 
We have two matters before the court, the plaintiff's objection to order changing domicile and custody and defendant's motion to change parenting time. Mr. Podell, why don't we start with you? Uh, we filed our objection in this matter, Your Honor, because uh, Mr. Weller indicates that, and he's not disputing whether Mr. Wesley Todd sent out a proof of service regarding this hearing. He's just saying he didn't get it. And from a historical angle here, Your Honor, Mr. Weller has always appeared at hearings. He's never missed a hearing. In fact, you know, he's the one that initiated proceedings to establish a parenting time order in this case. It's his position that the from, from what he could ascertain, Mr. Weller later learned that the motion was served on his prior counsel. Um, it, and it may have been sent to her and Mr. Weller, but that that attorney had rejected service. That's, that's the information that he got when he contacted uh, re, uh, his, his prior firm that he had retained. Uh, and that he only later found out about the hearing after the fact. Um, let, suffice it to say, Your Honor, that if you look at the prior order that was entered in December of 23, it, it does grant Ms. Tyree sole legal custody, but I, I ache in this too, you can paint stripes on a horse, it doesn't make it a zebra, because there are provisions in the order despite the fact that it says that she has sole legal, that says that major decisions regarding education, medical treatment, and even to move out of state are decisions that need to be made between the parties. Well, Mr. Podell, the judgment doesn't say the add on there or if the move out of state, it just says educational and medical. And, and then for out of state, it just says that she has to seek court's permission. Correct. Yes. Uh, and so, and when we look at the motion itself to change domicile, you know, I'm not going to go back in and look at the motion. We're dealing with your objection and the defendant's motion to change parenting time. Very well, Your Honor. So with that, Your Honor, he, he is objecting to the entry of the change of domicile. He believed that it's more akin to a change in custody. Uh, and, and I think that is really solidified in the motion to change parenting time. Because the proposal is that Mr. Weller would receive all but the first, last, and a midweek during the summer, and then he would continue to enjoy holidays. But Mr. Weller already gets half the summer. So what, what the deal really is for Mr. Weller is that he would get an extra two and a half weeks during the summer, and that's supposed to make up for all but one all but the last weekend each month during the school year that he would normally exercise. And so I, I truly believe, Your Honor, that this really is a disruption of an established custodial environment with Mr. Weller, and it really is more akin to a change in custody. Okay, thank you. Mr. Todd, uh, what's, what's your response? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, I, I think one part of the issue that the plaintiff does not understand is the prior order gives my client sole legal and primary physical custody. Um, so the argument that this is akin to a change in custody doesn't really make sense because she already, already has primary physical custody anyway. But beyond that, in terms of the objection, it is not accurate that it was only sent to his prior attorney. The proof of the service is on file contained within the motion and we sent it directly to his address in Lowell. Uh, additionally, the actual order was sent directly to his address. And then curiously, after the order was entered, then he objects. We don't believe that there's any uh, real valid defense here because of the fact that my client does in fact have sole legal custody. We are requesting that the objection be denied in total and we are requesting attorney fees. Service was proper. However, he did not attend the hearing. The time frame to object has passed. There's no allegation of good cause as to why he did not necessarily attend the hearing. There's no real meritorious defense as my client has sole legal custody and primary physical custody. So we believe that the objection itself should be denied and we are respectfully requesting attorney fees on that portion of the matter. In terms of the modification of parenting time, 
again, my client was granted primary physical custody. She is planning her move to Nebraska. Um, in essence, defendant is receiving basically standard parenting time with one additional weekend during the school year. So we believe a most appropriate and pragmatic result is that the plaintiff would be given the majority of this, or all of the summer in essence, with the exception of one week before school and one week after school, and one week uh, during the summer for my client to exercise vacation, and then outside of that, alternating holidays, and that he could have one weekend per month. This is substantially more than two and a half weeks of parenting time and again, it doesn't modify the uh, custodial environment in relation to what's actually contained within the order. So we are respectfully requesting that change in parenting time and the objection itself to be dismissed in total and requesting attorney fees for having to defend that. Okay. Well, in this matter, the court did uh, review the pleadings. And uh, in this case, court does note that the court had previously granted a change of domicile pursuant to MCL 722.31. And as I stated previously, just because the order requires the parties to communicate on medical and educational issues, that doesn't change legal custody, which was granted to the defendant in this particular matter. The court does not find any basis to uh, again revisit or change the uh, uh, order for change of domicile. So the court will deny the objection at this time. I'm not going to grant any uh, costs or fees in this uh, particular point. Court will note that the uh, defendant had made a proposal as it relates to change in parenting time, obviously, presumably as a result of the move. Uh, there was a proposal under paragraph five. Uh, and if the plaintiff does not believe that that is appropriate or agreeable, then the court would send the matter to a referee for an evidentiary hearing on the issue of parenting time. So that's what we'll do. Mr. Todd, you can uh, uh, do an order denying the objection. The court will refer it to the referee. If you get a, uh, a agreement in, or I guess before that hearing, then let the court know and we'll pull that matter off. Absolutely, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. You're free to go. Have a good day. I'm Courtney Whalen versus Justin Whalen. Court will note the appearance of Mr. Toth on behalf of the plaintiff, defendant appearing in pro per. This matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion for temporary custody, support, parenting time, exclusive use. The court notes uh, as set forth in the motion that uh, the parties had apparently signed a consent judgment of divorce in this matter. Uh, Mr. Toth, you can proceed. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, uh, as the court has just indicated, yes, that the parties did approve a proposed consent judgment of divorce, and I believe that there's also been a default that's been filed against Mr. Whalen in this case. I would note that there has been no answer filed to the motion. Um, I, I, was, I, I know that the parties have been talking, Your Honor, and there was perhaps a discussion about a resolution um, I've not had any direct communication with Mr. Whalen. I don't know if that's the case or not. The I believe that the the, the proposal anyway was to um, uh, well. I don't know what the status is. My client advised me that um, that that her husband was going to appear. So here we are. Okay. So well, let's so, let's see what he has to say, Mr. Whalen. What's uh, what's your response to the motion? Um, I'm I'm kind of confused about the whole thing. I know I was supposed to go in and sign documents this early this morning, but I'm just out of town and I got too short of notice. Okay. You have any response? Do I have a response? Your Honor? Yes. Yeah, there is a revised uh, agreement that is supposed to be was supposed to be signed early this morning for me. Um, it just hasn't been signed yet. So, so Your Honor, with those statements from Mister. Um, Waylon, I think that perhaps the best way to proceed would be for me to go ahead and identify um, what I believe the terms of the agreement to the temporary order were, and that um, um, if he then agrees, then I'll go ahead and prepare it, and I can just go ahead and then notice it for entry, ahead, given Mr. those Tell statements. 
So, so Your Honor, what we're looking for would be more specificity to, well, let's start with the easy part, which would be the exclusive use of the marital home. Mr. Mr. Whalen has moved to, I think he's living in Kalamazoo now. He has his own residence. My client has remained in the marital home, and actually it's um, separate marital property um, or separate property as opposed to marital property. And she would simply like an order that would grant her temporary exclusive use of the house and she would retain all obligations to maintain it, pay for it, um, pay the taxes and the insurance during that period of time. As we move forward to the issues relating to the children, Your Honor, the, the proposed judgment of divorce did not have a specific parenting time schedule. It was simply as the parties could agree. They've had trouble agreeing. So what we would be looking for would be an order that would be the standard parenting time schedule, which according to the Calhoun County schedule for alternating holidays and breaks with a week on week off summer schedule. Um, it, the deviation would be in our, our prayer for relief in the motion. There was a, a provision that there would be no overnight guests slash girlfriend during the pendency of this action. In other words, no overnight cohabitation. That will be eliminated from the order that I anticipate preparing, Your Honor. The school year schedule would be the traditional uh, alternate weekend schedule with the midweek. And um, rather than recalculate support, Your Honor, we had a calculation attached to the proposed judgment of divorce based upon the child, Michigan Child Support Guidelines, and we would ask, or I would then include that in the temporary order. The, part, the temporary order would provide that the parties would share joint legal custody with the plaintiff in this case, as is indicated in the signed consent order retaining the primary physical custody of the children. Okay. With that, uh, Mr. Whalen, uh, is that what you are going to agree to? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Toth. You can submit that under seven day. And uh, or if, if Mr. Whalen wants to come and sign, he can sign that and we can take care of it in that manner. I'll, I'll seven day it, Your Honor. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. You're free to go. Have a good day. Summer McKediak versus Mark McKediak. Today is Monday, June 17, 2024 at 10.03 a.m. Court will note the appearance of Mr. Hauser on behalf of the plaintiff, defendant appearing in pro per in this matter. Mr. McKediak, are you disputing the denial of parenting time pursuant to the uh, show cause motion? Um, yes. Okay. If so, then what the court will do is uh, the court will uh, have to have an evidentiary hearing on the denial of parenting time. As it stated uh, in the uh, ex parte order, court will not change custody without an evidentiary hearing. So an evidentiary hearing would be necessary to do that. And that's by case law from the Court of Appeal Supreme Court repeatedly telling trial courts they can't change custody without an evidentiary hearing. The court would, however, as I did under the uh, ex parte, would order that uh, the defendant would not remove the children from the state of Michigan without court approval in this uh, particular matter. And Correct. with that, uh, I think that takes care of everything until we can get in and have a uh, evidentiary hearing well in, in in both in both of these matters i guess okay your honor yes um i'm going to be turning myself in in the morning i have to go serve five months in jail oh. um so um i don't know how you would like to go about that well if you're not available uh is there any problem with them placing the uh the uh, children with the uh plaintiff in the interim um, no, Your Honor. She's been charged with uh, two counts of fourth degree child abuse. She is not allowed any okay. no overnight security time, nothing. Okay, well, except, except I, guess, I guess we're going to have to deal with that all at some later point. But uh, if you're going to be in for about five months, we won't be able to have a hearing within that uh, particular time. So, but we'll unfortunately, do, it's not. We'll set, a, we'll set a, well, we can always have a hearing because they can present you and we can do that during Zoom. So we'll we'll get we'll set up a hearing and then uh, have everyone present at that time. Uh, Mr. McKediak, you're going to have to uh, make sure that uh, you can. Uh, if there's anybody you want to testify or anything of that nature, you're going to have to make sure that, that you can get the subpoenas out, and that will all be by Zoom. Okay, sir. 
Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Your okay. Honor. You have a blessed day. Thank you. Your Honor, is the evidentiary hearing that was just mentioned as it relates to the show cause going to be separate than the friend of the court ev evidentiary hearing currently set for June 25th? Oh, there. What, what's the June 25th date? Uh, that was in relation to the continuation of the front of the court hearing that we began up in Grand Traverse County that was objecting to the to the to the custody order that was put in place back in December, December uh, before the case was transferred over to Calhoun. OK, well, what, well, we'll have that matter. The show cause will come up at the same time. Uh, recognize. Uh, Mr. McKediak, what, what county are you in that that's going to happen, that you're going to go to jail? Uh, Segal County. Okay. We just want to know so we'd be able to make contact with you. Yes, sir. Okay. Th thank you. You're free to go. Have a good day. Ari Conkright versus Taylor Morgan with intervening parties, Jamie Morgan and Carlina Morgan. Uh, court will note the appearance of Ms. Reed on behalf of the plaintiff, Mr. Bartell on behalf of the intervening party. Uh, the matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion to stay pending appeal. Mr. Bartell has filed an answer. Uh, Ms. Reed, I don't need to, again, rehash your motion. If you want to respond to anything in uh, Mr. Bartell's answer, go ahead. It's just that we're dealing with a constitutionally protected right in this matter, Your Honor. We do not believe any evidence has been presented to rebut the presumption that is in place to protect that right. There is no risk of harm to the child for the denial of grandparenting time. There is a risk of harm to the child if grandparenting time is exercised because this child does not want to see the grandparents. And to call her out of the house kicking and screaming would be traumatic to her. And that there has not been a best interest finding pursuant to MCL 722.27B6, which is required by the court to conduct and place that finding and that analysis on the record and that hasn't happened yet. So how this order kind of got entered, allowing grandparenting time is backwards is that all the requirements were not met. So we're requesting that the effect of the order be stayed pending appeal or that it be rescinded and we go to an evidentiary hearing regarding the presumption and the best interest factors. Okay. Mr. Bartow. Your Honor, this court has ever right under MCR 3.207A to issue a temporary order with, with regard to, quote, any matter within its jurisdiction. And that is right on point, Your Honor. And that is quoted from the court rule and grandparenting time is within this court's discretion or within this court's jurisdiction. So clearly the court has the ability to enter a temporary order. It is a little confusing from plaintiff's motion. Uh, it kind of vacillates back and forth between whether this is a final order or a temporary order. Clearly it's a, a temporary order. They would need an interlocutory appeal in this matter. The court weighed everything that was put in the motion and answer at the previous motion hearing, determined there was a preponderance of evidence to rebut the presumption of the statute. Further, as we had put in the our uh, motion, uh, the court had previous hearings in which this court had heard from Mr. Cronkite, and he is under had been under oath previously, where he had said that the grandparents were the ones who were really watching the uh, grandchild and not Taylor Morgan. And then he does an about face under oath again when it is convenient for him to say, oh, they never even watched really the kid at all. So, Your Honor, I, I think that motion before the court here should be denied since the court has every right and authority pursuant to the court rules. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Well, at the time that the court put in place the uh, temporary order, the court did note as stated by Mr. Bartell, what the uh, status quo was, which is now disputed. And the plaintiff has delineated many reasons in the motion, uh, but the court would note that, uh, again, those are just allegations and conjecture at this point without having a hearing in this matter. And the court, the intent was, is the court would have a hearing, but I was only maintaining the status quo on a temporary basis at this point, the court will not stay the order if the front of the court, excuse me, if the Court of Appeals wishes to do so, they may do so on the, during their review. But the court is going to deny the motion to stay 
the uh, order in this matter. Mr. Bartel, you can uh, prepare an order denying that motion, and that will conclude the matter for now. You're free to go. Have a good day. Andrew Cady versus Ella Groff. Court will note the appearance of Ms. Redmond on behalf of the defendant. This matter comes before the court on the defendant's motion for temporary support, custody, parenting time. Ms. Redmond. Good morning. Um, Ms. Uh, Grapp and Mr. Cady have been separated since February of this year. Ms. Grapp currently has a PPO against Mr. Cady um, and is living in the home with the three children. Uh, Mr. Cady has not had overnight parenting time with the children since separation and has instead exercised non-overnight parenting time around uh, two times per week. We are asking that this schedule uh, continue, that she be awarded temporary sole physical and legal custody for the pendency of this action, that Mr. Cady be awarded parenting time on Fridays from 1 to 5 p.m., Sundays from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, to reflect the, the current schedule that the children have been, um, have been used to since uh, February separation, and that Mr. Cady's income be imputed um, to reflect the potential income of a computer programmer, which is his um, training and past experience um, in the area for at least part-time work. Ms. Grapp does have concerns about uh, Mr. Cady having overnight parenting time, including the special medical needs of the children. Aurora, who's 11, has diabetes. Mr. Cady has in the past routinely slept through her blood sugar monitor, has returned Aurora to, uh, from parenting time to Ms. Grapp with expired glucose sensors, um, he has also in the past refused to take Burko, who was only a few months at the time, a uh, few months old at the time, to the emergency room after that was recommended by a medical professional. He even threatened to crash the car that Miss Grapp and Burko were in when they were when she requested that he take them to the emergency room. Miss Grapp had to wait until they returned home, and Mr. Katie fell asleep on the couch to be able to take Burko to his emergency room for care. And she is worried that uh, similar um, that the children will have similar um, that Mr. Katie will not be able to uh, make interests make decisions in their best interests if he does have overnights, considering their their medical needs. He's also been violent towards Miss Grapp in the presence of the children, including threatening to break down the door of the children's bedrooms while the children were inside it. And she fears that he may be violent and aggressive towards the children if she is not there to intervene like she has in the past when they did live together. Um, as well as that, his, his housing situation has, has been unstable. Um, it is our understanding that he may, that he's moving into a new apartment. He has lived with his parents, um, again, to our understanding, living outside the home, not in the home. Um, and again, um, Ms. Grapp believes his, his housing is unstable to support overnight parenting at this time. So for those reasons, she's asking for that specific parenting time, non-overnight, Fridays and Sundays, to reflect what the children are used to, what their routine is, as well as to protect them in their medical needs, their special medical needs, um, and for their safety. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Katie, what's, uh, what's your response? To address some of this uh, in order here that you just said it, first of all, it's uh, what she said about the, the current schedule of uh, of uh, me seeing the kids is um, omitting the fact that they expect me to be have have it one hour every day. Currently, at seven p.m. to eight p.m. And but, but before I even say that, let me say uh, I've said to Ella over and over that I'm available twenty four seven, and I've been trying everything I can to get uh, get more time with my kids, and I don't have enough time with them to. Uh, to provide anything like I could and I did in the past to them. And oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I it, actually before I address what what she just said, what what Miss Revan said. Well, uh, just go ahead uh, and address something, sir. I, I'm 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 way behind on my hearings and respond uh, to the re the emotion. Okay, no, but I have to explain that we are homeschooling parents and uh, I and and the educate so the, the kids don't go to school. We educate them at home, so I got to I got to talk about that just a little bit, and and uh, to explain, um, you know, it's different from most uh, most parents. Um, yeah, I'm, and I'm sorry about. I'm trying to be trying to be quick here. I'm, you know, it's very hard for me. To, but okay, so yeah, we are homeschooling parents, and I and I, and I did in the past. Uh, you know, I, I was able to have enough time with them where I could uh, I could educate them, and and I, I can't do that on, under this schedule, and it, they um, rely on, and Ella even relies on me. And my help for for the homeschooling and has always um, okay. So, but 
But anyways, the current, the current schedule is not, as she said, and it's also hasn't been going on. She said it's been, it would, you know, it, it's going to go on since February. But actually, there was a period where we had uh, a 50-50 sharing agreement, which is what I'd like to ask for as a temporary uh, schedule. There, that 50-50 agreement wasn't overnight, but it was supposed to be 50-50 day trading days. And it, it worked a lot better for our family. And, our, you know, the kids don't want to keep the current schedule. They are really excited about staying overnight with me they've said it again and again especially my younger daughter and even you know my son burko is not speaking but it's too too young but um but i mean i can you know you can you can read his facial expressions he's he's well okay anyways um so even what she said about the current schedule is not true it's very important to have that hour together with those kids at one point we were taking uh daily walks for that hour but uh ella wouldn't let that happen and uh so the best we could do was a one hour virtual uh um meeting but i've, I've actually spent a lot more time in that hour because i've able i've been able to um kind of uh well she well she's also been uh relying on my mother for babysitting and and during a lot of the time when she's relying on my mother for babysitting i also spend time with the kids so she's she's vastly understating the, the amount of time that the kids uh, have with me and the fact that they they expect and hope for more and and, and so do I and I've always been and we both the you know my my two daughters and myself have all been pushing to get more time that's why why we even uh, have that much time in the first place uh Giselle has been um resisting that uh, okay so then I want to talk uh, the next thing um I think that handles the first thing she said the next thing uh she was talking about uh, is the is the medical concerns and you know if I could I know, I know I have to be brief here, but if I could go into detail, I mean, it would sound really, I think she, her claims would sound really silly, but I'm going to try to um, explain. Well, one thing is that um, as far as like decision-making, I mean, uh, we, we have a whole, I mean, okay. So <laughs> oh, actually, let me talk about the overnight the sleeping through the alarms. Okay. So both of us would sleep through alarms until one of us got up to get the alarm. And, uh, you know, um, she would usually get it, but that's, um, but, but, but let me tell you as a, as a programmer, I, I wrote a program to, to plug the, the, uh, alert system into that would, uh, give, that would provide a, a second alert system using the speakers, the stereo speakers, and it would blast the, blast the audio enough to wake up everybody in the house. And I mean, that's how serious I, I was taking this, I, you know, when we were together and, and, uh, that system, we stopped using it because Rory was getting up herself with the alarm system. But um, and that, so we haven't had that system in use, but I built that system and I take it very seriously, uh, you know, treating Rory's diabetes. And I took it so I mean, I learned a lot about endocrinology and I we, we so there's a story that I want to tell, you know, the, the first the first night, you know, that uh, we were in the hospital with Rory when she had ketoacidosis. So she had to go to the ICU, the pediatric ICU. And I, I didn't know about type one diabetes. And, uh, um, uh, I mean, Ella actually, I, to her credit, she diagnosed type one diabetes and, uh, I didn't, I didn't believe her. And not only that, the, the urgent care didn't believe her. And, uh, it turned out that she was right. And, uh, you know, but, um, but anyways, we ended up in the ICU and, uh, I just spent all night uh, studying endocrinology, and I, I told Ella that we you know we should go on a low carb diet. Uh, the whole family, not not that the whole family needs it, but for for Rory's you know blood sugar control and it, otherwise. Well, anyways, I was reading all about that. Then we talked to the doctor. The doctor recommended Sir, against. Sir, if you would confine yourself to the issues of custody and parenting time and support, you're getting off on a lot of tangents. I'm sorry, I don't have time for that today. I'm sorry. Well. If I could just finish the story, the, the the doctor recommended a diet. We tried it for a year. Then we tried what I recommended, and and it worked. And the doctor said, "You can't argue with the results." And you know, it was, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm taking these, I'm taking medical decisions for Rory very seriously. I take I take her type one diabetes very seriously. I put a lot of effort into that. Okay, so the next thing she said, um, well, she said I refused to take Burko to the hospital, but I drove him all the way to the hospital, and I turned around because she didn't have her phone, and you know. I, I felt like we needed that phone. I went back to get the phone and I was too tired to drive. And, and she got a, she got a ride from my mom. It was okay. Uh, but she's just telling the story with all these facts admitted. Um, 
And, uh, you know, she's, she's made claims, allegations that are going to fall apart if we can examine them in enough detail. And I know we can't today. Um, but I mean, they will have uh, a lot of uh, evidence I've collected of our, of our recordings of our conversations that will. Um, but okay, so, so there's that. I think I, okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, so another thing about the fact that we're homeschooling is that we don't have any kind of uh, schedule, and we're not just homeschooling, we don't have, we don't have regular jobs. We don't have any kind of schedule um, conflicts to work around. There's no reason to limit my time to the weekend. Uh, but Ella's doing that. Ella has insisted that it has to be Friday night and Saturday morning. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, another thing about the establishment, I'm sorry, I forgot to say this before, is that she says it. She says that the, what they what the kids are used to is four hours per day, but that's not true. What what they're used to and what they expect and ask for, well, not they don't even have to ask for it. They expect it, and Ella has initially resisted, but now she no longer even resists the kids. That they stay until bedtime with me, and then I send it back. And they, even they, even then, they you know my younger daughter, she always asks to stay overnight. She doesn't want to go back for you know bedtime to mom. Uh, I mean, not that she doesn't want to sleep there, but she hasn't. She hasn't had enough time with me. They they know that they lost their dad almost. You know, it, it, it's been reduced to these video meetings one hour per day that it are, are not as satisfactory as in person time. Uh, they, there's no more education provided by me, and I, you know, I can I go into detail later, I guess. But I, you know, I'm I've been driving the educational planning and the education okay. for the family. Even sure, as you need to, you need to conclude, please. Oh my gosh. Okay, so. So yeah, and also, also I have a I have a great place for them that they really love. Um, they really want to spend time there. They really want to spend and um, um, and uh, um, so I'm just looking at my notes here on the table here. Okay, see if there's anything else I can throw in here. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, my my uh. Oh yeah. So another thing is that we had a lot of standards that were were kept for our kids that have declined in in uh, the household without my help. And uh, you know, Ella would really Ella herself would benefit hugely if I could have the kids more and she had more time to herself, you know, to clean the house and to you know. Okay, do I'm not concerned needs. about any time she has for herself. Just address custody. Well, I mean, it Sir, would be good for our kids. Please, right? is the house the house? I mean, Ella has. All right, so. So yeah, for for I mean, for to be able to take care of herself it would be better for the kids if she had more time, you know, to, okay. to keep the house up, uh, which is not being done. I mean, and please and to, conclude, sir. All right. Um. Sorry. Uh. So yeah, just uh, so my, what I'm what I was trying to say there is that Ella by herself has to is, is forced to lower the standards that we had previously established on diet education paying attention to the kids, you know, attention given to the kids and, and language practice for, for my young uh, son who's just learning language. Um, and uh, I, I uh, also, I didn't address, um, she's talking about uh, Im imputing income for a programmer. And I mean, I, I'm not trying to avoid making income. I'm doing a lot you know, to try to make income, not by getting a job though, because I mean, the market for labor here really isn't available to me. Um, so, but I have, uh, you know, my, um, I have a, an independent research career that's been not financially successful, but it has, you know, resume okay, points. Thank but, you, sir. I, I don't need okay. to hear anything else. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The court's going to, in this matter, uh, Courts heard the uh, again the evidence, or at least uh, the allegations in this uh, particular matter. Read the pleadings in this case. What the court is going to do is the court will grant to the defendant temporary custody, uh, subject to parenting time with the plaintiff. Court notes based the party schedules. They haven't had anything consistent. They don't work consistent jobs. What the court is going to do is grant to the plaintiff. Uh, parenting time on alternating days from 12 o'clock noon until 4 o'clock p.m. each alternating day starting on June 20, 2024 and each alternating day thereafter. The court will 
uh, order that the parties would exchange any income information that they have within seven days of today's date. Uh, again, if, again, we don't have any uh, income or if it's sporadic, the court will impute to each party the sum of $15 per hour on a full-time basis. The court would order that the parties would communicate through a communication app such as Our Family Wizard or Family Close or any of the other apps that the parties can agree upon. If not, then they'll use Our Family Wizard. And I'll ask uh, Ms. Redmond that you would prepare that order and submit under seven day notice of entry. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. You're free to go. Have a good day. The court will note the appearance of Ms. McKenzie on behalf of plaintiff, Ms. Podolsky on behalf of the defendant. The matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion for modification of parenting time. I have read all the pleadings in this matter. I don't need you to reiterate that as I have a lot of motions yet to uh, address. So if you could maybe respond to the other parties, uh, again, pleadings. Ms. McKenzie. Uh, with with regard to the answer, the uh, Mr. Howe's older child is going to be switching schools. That's one of the allegations in Ms. Podolsky's answer. And so he will be uh, attending the Portage uh, Public Schools. So that is a non-answer. The fact that... Uh, the child is only in first grade and is not doing well, uh, bears some um, consideration in this matter because the Portage schools offer a greater amount of opportunities. And I expect that the child will be able to thrive and do better in a larger district uh, where she can have multiple opportunities during a single day. There is an allegation in Ms. Podolsky's uh, answer that the child is receiving certain help under Title I. Well, that is a federal program that is available to all schools and would be available if both parents feel that it is uh, benefiting their daughter. That is uh, available at the Portage schools also because it's federal money. So I believe that uh, we are simply asking for a modification of parenting time that is consistent with the uh, case law and in addition, under 7, 722.27, which defines the established custodial environment, there would not be a change of established custodial environment because the child is still going to look to, if, if she is permitted to attend the Portage schools, at, where she would live with daddy during the school year, uh, Sunday through the following Friday, the established custodial environment would not change because the child would still look to uh, the custodian in that environment. So daddy during the school week, during the school year, and mommy on the weekends and during vacations. So she would naturally look to the custodians that she now looks to for guidance, discipline, and the necessities of life as well as parental comfort. This is si simply designed, this motion is designed to give her greater opportunities, cultural opportunities, um, academic opportunities, uh, dramatics, music, and so forth, because she would be attending a school with the advantage of a larger district, which does have a good reputation in, in the greater Battle Creek, Kalamazoo uh, uh, community. So we're asking the court to entertain the idea of uh, changing, allowing the change of schools for the reason that the child will have the opportunity for greater advantages uh, due to the largeness of the school district, but this opportunity is still not going to change the established custodial environment, which still, which is and will remain with both mom and dad. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Podolsky? Thank you, Your Honor. As we stated in our response, this motion was improperly filed. The issue of changing a school district is an issue regarding legal custody, and this was a motion to modify a parenting time schedule. What we have here is the plaintiff is getting married and moving to Portage. As we stated in our response, he's going to continue to work here in Battle Creek, and that was not denied by counsel today. So if the court were to entertain this motion and then ultimately decide that this minor child should move to the Portage School District, we'd still have both parents here in Battle Creek in Calhoun County during the work and school day while this minor child is in Portage. This happens frequently when parties move to the next county over, whether it's Jackson County, Kalamazoo County, 
and it does not necessitate a school change. Right now, she is in a smaller school district. They have assessed her for her needs. They have a plan in place for her. As we stated in our response, it is my client who is solely getting her to summer school this summer. The plaintiff is not participating in that program, despite alleging that the minor child struggles. This proposed change is going to make her, you know, a small fish in a big pond. And nothing in their motion stated why this would be a benefit for her and what could be offered for her. What was stated is the plaintiff is getting remarried and moving to Portage, and therefore all of these changes need to occur. That is not the case. The motion is improper. They have not cited proper cause or change of circumstance to make this change. And on top of that, their proposed schedule would result in my client losing one month of parenting time per year. When these parties have joint custody, week on, week off, 50-50 parenting time, one month out of six is huge. That's a 20% reduction. So we're asking this court to deny the motion in, the, in its entirety and order that the status quo continue as it relates to custody, parenting time, and the school district, which is currently Penfield. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McKenzie, any response? No, Your Honor. Okay. Well, in this matter, the court does note that the judgment of divorce uh, entered on December 5, 2022, does provide for joint legal and joint physical custody. And as stated, the parties have been exercising that in alternating weeks. The plaintiff seeks to modify effectively the parenting time, and the court takes that as really seeking to change custody. The court does not believe that uh, proper cause or change in circumstances has been presented to meet the Vodvarka threshold sufficient for an evidentiary hearing, notwithstanding the fact that the motion is calling it parenting time as opposed to custody. The court also does not believe that the threshold has been established for a Lombardo hearing concerning the school. Uh, so the court will deny the motion at this time. Ms. Podolsky, you can prepare that order and submit under seven day. Thank you. Thank you. You're free to Thank go. Thank you, Your Honor. Court will note the appearance of Ms. McNiff on behalf of plaintiff, Ms. McKenzie on behalf of defendant. This matter is before the court on the defendant's motion for attorney fees and costs. Ms. McKenzie. Thank you, Your Honor. We're asking the court to uh, require Mr. Fields to pay uh, attorney fees and costs for this matter because the defendant is not able to bear the expenses of continuing to defend this custody matter. Uh, I'm we have filed pursuant to MCR 3.206 parent D, which does allow uh, a party to petition the court at any time. And I have specified the reasons that uh, Ms. Bird is unable to bear the expense. Uh, and I have alleged uh, pursuant to the verified statement filed back in January in this case, Mr. Fields did, did under uh, penalty of perjury indicate that he earned $2,000 per week, which would be a total of $104,000 uh, every year. Ms. Uh, Bird has consistently attended school. She has graduated from PA school. She is involved in the uh, uh, physician assistant profession. Uh, she is wishing to go to the state of Tennessee to pursue that, that goal and to be with family and provide her children with additional maternal uh, family um, companionship. And she has had to resign her position in order to take a position in Tennessee, but there's a gap of time for her to um, uh, get licensed. And, and so she is still working at the previous employer, but only on a contingent basis. And as of uh, June 13, she had received only 36 hours. So there is there's a gap of time for her to be able to earn a consistent, predictable income in the state of Tennessee in her profession, which she she spent a lot of money on um, obtaining school loans and is repaying her school loans uh, because she is departing the Battle Creek uh, urgent care position early. She's paying $833.33 per month. Uh, she has a penalty, of a breach of contract penalty, a stipulated agreement for $10,000, and that is being paid off at $833.33 per month. But if the court looks back a little bit, she 
was forced because of domestic violence, she was forced to leave the household and did not stick around to collect any money, ask for any um, remuner remuneration for her part of the household that the parties were living in at the time that she needed to leave for her safety because of domestic violence. So Mr. Fields has a home with 30 acres and he has all of the furnishings and uh, additional personal property items, plus the contribution that Ms. Fields, Ms. Bird, excuse me, Ms. Bird made to his purchase of that home. Ms. Bird sold her home that the parties were living Mr. McKenzie, in. McKenzie, I'm not going to re, uh, readdress any property dispute that uh, or res resolution in this particular matter. So it, it, I, I'm simply explaining, uh, and I'm almost done. I, I'm simply explaining why Miss Bird is in the financial uh, situation that she's in right now. Part of it is the having to leave the job to take the the job in Tennessee which does not start now until the middle of July. Why, why did she Why did she resign so early when there was a gap then? Why didn't she wait and resign prior, just prior to going to Tennessee then? She, she was, she believed that she would be starting earlier in the state of Tennessee. And the, the uh, position that she's taking is a Michigan based firm starting to uh, provide healthcare providers such as uh, physician assistants in the state of Tennessee. Their time frame changed after Ms. Bird uh, resigned from the Battle Creek position because she she did not um, intentionally cause the the gap of time. So the start date became a moving target, but that was after she had resigned from the Battle Creek urgent care uh, employment position. So the, she's faced with, with this, but she did take it upon herself to work for the very same employer as often as she can. She's working contingent, but like I say, that, that hasn't resulted in a whole lot of hours, but I think the court does need to consider that she started on, on at a disadvantage because she did not get any uh, funding, uh, any consideration, financial consideration for setting up her new household when she had to leave uh, leave the household. So, you know, there was a financial issue anyway. She's paying just under $1,200 for child support. Um, she's ha having to repay uh, $833.33 per month uh, as a settlement rather than face um, a trial, a breach of contract, and a, and a very expensive uh, court proceeding with regard to the urgent care company. So the she's simply running out of money, Your Honor. And uh, the court rule 3206D does allow her to petition the court. But I, I did want the court to have the background of she's not been a wealthy person for a, a number of years and she does have school loans, which she's paying back. And as I mentioned in the pleadings, part of the school loans were there, there was a, uh, Certain, there were certain parameters that she was eligible for, like those of us who've gone to law school. You're eligible for so much. She used, she maxed those out in part to pay for living expenses for the plaintiff as well as the party's children uh, when they were residing together. So there, any savings, any uh, financial plus that she might have had does not exist for each of those various reasons. She She's expecting to be able to recoup all of these, get back on her feet. I'm not sure recoup, but get back on her feet and provide well for the children by taking the, the new position in the state of Tennessee. But at the moment, the, the earliest date is going to be the middle of July. Thank you. Um, Ms. McNiff, uh, do you have anything to add other than what was contained in your answer? No, Your Honor. Okay. Well, in this matter, the court notes that the uh, defendant has attempted to bring up the issue of property division. That was taken care of well uh, before this uh, particular issue, so the court's not going to take that into consideration. Uh, the court will note that she resigned her position in Battle Creek 
to start a job in Tennessee, which now uh, won't start until mid-July. Court is looking at uh, Michigan Court Rule 3.206 parens D as to whether the party shows they are unable to bear the expense or other, and the other party is able to pay. The court does note that it does appear that the defendant's problem and difficulties at this time occurs because she voluntarily quit her job, uh, thereby leaving her unable to pay her attorney fees and expenses. And uh, uh, court will note the defendant is responsible for her own self-inflicted financial position, I guess you'd say. Uh, it's not anything attributable to the plaintiff in this matter, nor would it be a normal situation. She unfortunately got caught in some issues concerning the start of the job and that, but that's, again, that's by her own doing in this matter. The court will find that the, uh, the defendant has not established a basis for attorney fees in this uh, matter. So the court will deny the motion. Ms. McNiff, you can prepare the denial and submit under seven day notice of entry. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you all. You're free to go. Have a good day. Thank you, Your Honor. Marissa Thompson versus Demarcus McKinney. Defendant's motion to set aside referee. And you say that, sir, in this matter, I asked for alternate weeks. I received standard pairing time and your support was raised. And you said, I quote, I feel this is not what is best for the child, end quote. Yes. Any factual or legal errors that you can point to that the referee made in this matter? I understand you don't you don't like the results, but that's not a basis to object. Yes, um, in the paperwork there was stated that I only have two children. That is false. I am on support for more than two children. I have more than two children. That is a legal error. Okay. My other support was based off of that. Those are also dependents that I take care of. I have another. What was the what was that last statement? Other what? But those are other dependents that I take care of. I, okay, no, you said you had other children. I did get that. Then what? What are these other dependents that you're claiming? Yes. No. Who are they? I don't know. You haven't told me who they are. I have children that I take care of. Do you need names? You want me to give you names, sir? I can... No, I, I want to know what. How are they related? Why are you taking care of somebody else? Uh, I have uh, Miss Thompson also has a daughter that I do for. Um, I have children that are related to me that I do like activities with. As far as spending money, there there could dependence. Um, I'm like my sister, for example, her her sons. I I get him every other weekend. Okay. As well. My boy. Let me tell you, sir, that's not going to change your support if you voluntarily assume responsibility okay. for somebody just, else's children. Okay, yeah, I understand. I was just answering your question. The only thing that I was trying to get corrected as far as that part was the fact that I have more than two kids. Okay. But, like, they are my biologically children. Okay. Well, that would that would be a basis to... Uh, to change what the court can do is the court will refer the matter back to the referee on the issue of support to take into consideration other children that you're paying support on. Anything yep. else, Mr. McKinney? Yes, sir. During the time that we had this hearing, I was explaining to him a situation that I had with a similar case. And I, I think he thought that that's what I was asking for with this case. I was not... Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm just saying what's what's been in your motion and what you've stated today. So okay. Before this hearing, me and Ms. Thompson had had a conversation. Before I remis, reminded Ms. Thompson about this hearing, she I guess changed her mind. Ms. Thompson is about to start working. I was going to keep my son while she was at work. She well, works Monday Friday. And okay. I, you you can address that. You can address that prior to the next referee hearing and then you can put that on the record if you're going to at that time miss okay. thompson is there anything else is there anything you have to say in this matter um i have no idea what's going on so no <laughs> okay well we'll refer it back to the referee because it does appear that there is a factual and a legal basis to review the uh, support issue uh because of the other minor children that were not taken into consideration so the court will uh, will do that and uh, 
We'll refer back. You'll get notice from the front of the court as to when that hearing is. You're free to go today. Have a good day. Two cases, uh, 2024-113-PP, Lindsay Mekediak versus John Mekediak, and 2024-391-PP, John Mekediak versus Lindsay Mekediak. In the first case, 113PP, Attorney Kaufman represents the respondent. Okay. Court notes uh, this matter is a continuation of the hearing commenced on June 10, 2024, in which uh, testimony was taken from both of the parties at that uh, particular time. And uh, we needed uh, to acquire some of the exhibits that... Uh, Ms. Huffman was not able to, uh, again, to uh, provide at that time. Those have been provided to the court. I will note uh, that we do have the uh, phone records from Verizon on uh, the respondent's account for the month of January and February in this matter, but those were the only ones that I received. Uh, Ms. Huffman, were there any other that I was supposed to receive that I didn't receive? Um, I do believe there should have been an April 20, uh, the, the last, sorry, I'm sorry, hang on one second. April, um, I'm sorry, March, the one in March, I do have that um, available to share. Uh, I believe that would be the only one the court should be missing. All the rest should be available to the court. Um, and then we did have, I did provide a copy of the um, proof of service to the court. Uh, I believe Mr. McKediak had a witness that he wanted to provide for that, but I'm not sure if he has that witness available. Okay. <laughs> well, we, last week was the time and place set for those particular witnesses. I have nobody in the waiting room. There's right no now. one in the waiting room, so there's no one to present, even if if you wanted to at this time. Ms. Okay. Hoffman, why don't you do the share and share the screen and we can look at the March, because that is the only one that I'm missing. March 18th is there. Does that highlight that for you? Highlights, can you enlarge it though? That's what I'm looking at. Uh, I'll ask the uh, petitioner, Ms. McKediak, can you see that uh, list of calls? No, I cannot see it. She's on, she's via telephone. Oh, okay. McKediak, uh, I've got a number of calls, probably about 10 to 12 calls on March 18. Give me, uh, just give me the first six digits of your phone number with the area code, because I don't want you to have to disclose your entire phone number. What is, what is your area code, ma'am? 268. Okay. But I would, I would like to just mention something, if I can. Yep, we'll give you time in just a minute. I was just checking out the, the list. That's fine. Uh, your Honor, if I could just add that there, I believe, is a color photograph um, that we did present to the court that shows that a car accident, it, it could be one in black and white, but it's a photo of across a rail, a rail guard, a guardrail, sorry. Uh, and then there's a wrecked car on the other side of that. Okay. And um, I, what's the purpose of that? That is my client's vehicle in Florida when it was wrecked in Florida, which is why he got the, um, and I and, and there was a, a person that died in that accident, uh, and my uh, my client had to get a rental car when he got back. And the only reason I'm provided that is because um, the petitioner indicated that the only reason my client would have rented a, a vehicle during the time in which we showed the court that there was a rental receipt um, would have been to drive the vehicle to. Florida, that proves my client was, that was his vehicle that was wrecked and the reason why my client had to rent a vehicle when he re returned back to Michigan. Okay. Ms. Hoffman, are you offering the, uh, again, the picture and the uh, phone records as exhibits in this matter? 
I am. So the January, uh, February, and March could be ad admitted as at one exhibit, exhibit A or, or one, however the court wishes. And then the pictures could be admitted as another exhibit. Okay. We'll do that as exhibit one and exhibit two. Ms. McKediak, anything else that you have? And my son, he's autistic and I'm at a school. And so this okay. is a well, little... Ma'am, first thing I want um, to ask is, uh, in this matter, Ms. Hoffman has offered Exhibit 1 and Exhibit 2 in this matter. Do you have any response to the offer? Just that um, with the phone calls, that um, if if he was to call, like, via Wi-Fi... Cause okay, ma'am, ma'am, I'm just that asking as it relates... Ma'am, hold on. As it relates to any any legal objection... To the offer of those that it wouldn't show up on a phone record oh okay that it would not show um his phone bill wi-fi phone calls do not show up on a phone record we will address that app phone calls also do not show up on a phone record anything else as it relates to that other than you know, I, his situation in Florida, I, I don't know what his situation is. Okay, Florida well, let's address, was, I'm gonna, I, I want to address, hold on, I want to address the exhibits first. Uh, the court will admit uh, respondents exhibit one and two in this matter, there being no legitimate objection to those. Uh, with that, I guess, Ms. Huffman, you have nothing else, is that correct? I have no further evidence, that's okay. correct. Okay, Ms. McKediak, anything else that you have in this matter? Uh, just that I w was contacted and told that he was in Florida. No, his uh, situation. Objection. Of what, uh, Florida, I'm going to object to that know. being hearsay. Well, we've established he was in Florida, so that's, I guess, not a big issue. So go ahead, Ms. McKediak, anything else? That is just what he had stated to me. I don't know what his situation was. It's um, during his phone call, he had stated that he was in Florida. So, okay. I mean, that's all I know. I don't know his situation of what took place or when he left or when he got back. I don't know. Okay. That's not, wasn't discovered over the phone call. Okay. Uh, Ms. McKediak, do you have any closing argument to make? I mean, uh, no, I guess not. Okay. No. Ms. Huffman, any uh, closing argument? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I would just state that um, on on February or for the February 11th incident, uh -huh. um, Ms. McKediak several times stated that he was in Florida. She stated um, that it was FaceTime call that um, she could, she knew that he was in Florida. Just now she said that someone told her that he was in Florida. When she testified, she said he told her he was in Florida. I just objected to her as it, her stating that somebody told her that as hearsay, uh -oh. um, but she said that anyway, the court allowed it. So I'm just saying that's what she just said right now is that someone told her. Uh, and and, and her, if I could just give my argument without interruption. Yeah, Ms. McKediak, do not interrupt. Thank you. Um, he simply, my client simply wants nothing to do with Ms. McKediak. He wants to get his divorce over. If that hasn't ended yet, last I knew, I think it was still open. He just wants to to be divorced, be done with her. He wants, he, he wants absolutely nothing to do with her. He's not contacting her. There's no proof that he's contacting her, even though she said for his January 27th call um, that it came from his phone. Specifically, it says, I spoke to both of them and it was from his phone. I provided the phone, um, the phone records for January, February, and March. None of these, in fact, not just those days, but every day. And none of the days have any calls to either of her number or her son's number, which she stated he also called her son's number. Those numbers are not on any of his records. Uh, the records come directly from his 
um, his phone company. Uh, they don't take numbers out to satisfy what Ms. McKediak wants them to say. Um, <laughs> so again, I would just there is significantly insufficient evidence to find <laughs> violated <laughs> any PPO. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Again, anything else, uh, Ms. McKediak, before the court gives you a ruling? Uh, just uh, no, he'll just keep bothering me. Okay, it, it, thank he you. Bothers me with different people and uh, so. Well, <laughs> if, if, if there's other people that are bothering you, you can always get a PPO uh, against them. Uh, again, that doesn't pertain to respondent. Uh, as a result, the court uh, is not going to address that. Specifically, in the uh, petition to show cause in this matter, the petitioner had alleged various dates on which things she said occurred. First, the first date was January 27, 2024. Second date, January, or excuse me, February 7, 2024. Then February 11, 2024. And then March 18, 2024. She also claims that, again, there was a uh, FaceTime call. I think that was the uh, I think that was the February 11, 2024 date. Uh, in this matter, the court has looked at the uh, exhibit one and looked at those particular records. The records show on uh, the January 27th, 2024 date that she claims and she delineated what the call was, et cetera. And uh, the court will note that on his uh, phone records, it does not show any calls from his phone to the 269-268 number, which she identifies as her number. Further uh, in this matter, that is the uh, January 27th date, the February 9, 2024 date in which she delineated a call to her uh, that looking at the records, there was no call from his phone on that date. On the 2-11-2024, the date of the alleged uh, face, FaceTime call that, in fact, uh, there was no FaceTime call on that, plus the testimony of the respondent was that in December 2023, that uh, plaintiff had blocked him from all social media contact to him. Further, on March 18, 2024, which we saw today, there was no call uh, to the plaintiff on that date from his phone call or from his phone number. Uh, taking all of that into consideration in this matter, it does amount to more than a he said, she said, as he has provided documentation and evidence to show that he did not contact her. And as a result, the court will deny the show cause and deny any finding of contempt in this matter. The court will next go to the respondents motion to terminate he alleges that he did not do any of the things as alleged court will note that credibility is always a consideration in every case and especially these types of cases oftentimes a party will allege that the other party or one of their witnesses is not truthful or lying the court has found that inconsistency in testimony does not mean that an individual has lied conflicting testimony can occur as a result of a witness's background perception bias understanding or misunderstanding or mistake. And when consistencies occur, the court will attempt to determine if they can be reconciled by other testimony or evidence. In this case, we have diametrically opposed uh, testimony. So the court has to look at other evidence and that other evidence is the exhibits that were submitted in this matter that shows that the respondent, Mr. McKediak has not contacted her in this matter, 
And so that evidence presented goes to, again, more than simply a he said, she said, but is backed up by other objective evidence to substantiate that, again, there was not contact. I'm not saying that there's not anything that's alleged to have happened, happened in this particular matter, but it does, again, go to the issue of credibility when we have someone making various statements and then that uh, testimony being, uh, again, refuted by objective evidence in this matter. As a result, based upon that, the court will grant the respondent's motion to terminate the petitioner's PPO in this matter. And I would simply caution both the parties, don't communicate with each other, don't contact each other. And in your case, Mr. Makediak, uh, even though the court has terminated that, I'll let you know that the court could at some future point uh, grant a new PPO if the circumstances warranted that. You understand that, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, that will be the order of the court or the orders of the court in this matter. And we'll conclude this case. You're free to go. Have a good day.